So you have the function of the stomach as a whole. If you look what actually tells the stomach to do that, it is the enteric nervous system, okay? It's the nervous system. So there are messages which are sent from the brain through a, a nerve, which I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with, called the vagus nerve. And this is a, let's say, a function of the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. So the stomach knowing how to do that at what times, knowing how much stomach acid to make, knowing how much to propel food when it needs to, knowing when to open and close the sphincter is coming from the brain. It's coming from the brain through the vagus nerve, okay? Same thing in the intestine. So the release of um, bicarbonate of enzymes from the pancreas, the um, the propulsion of food through the small intestine, the uh, development of immune cells at the intestinal barrier. In fact, even the intestinal barrier itself is dependent on messages coming from the brain to the vagus nerve, okay? Through the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is basically connecting. It's got it's like a tendrils all throughout the enteric nervous system. And the nerve bundles are so dense. Some of the densest nerve fibers are in the human gut. And there's this concept that, you know, you've got 80% of information potentially going up from the gut to the brain rather than from the brain to the gut. But I think, honestly, I think that the amount coming from the brain to the gut has been has been understated. All the, all the importance has been understated. And for this reason, so something that I'd really like your listeners to appreciate is that every single function of digestion, bar some of the autonomous things like the migrating motor complex, every single function of the digestive organs, and this includes the release of bile from the gallbladder, this includes the propulsion of food right the way throughout the intestine, um, every single one of these things is dependent on messages traveling through nerves from the brain, through the vagus nerve to the gut. Okay. And here's the thing is that if there is anything which blocks or prevents those messages from being sent, then the digestive organs lose the ability to know what to do. So you've got, you've got two main functions of digestive organs, right? You've got secretion and you've got motility or propulsion. Now, both of these functions begin to decline when, again, for whatever reason, there is an impairment of information coming from the brain to the gut. Okay. So this is what I consider the top down approach, right? And this is where things like, you know, uh, meditation and all of this other stuff, which is a lot of these things are looking at improving uh, vagus nerve function. So you have people who have high, high vagal tone or low vagal tone. And if you look at a lot of the evidence on inflammatory conditions on IBS, there's a lot of digestive research, or let's say, uh, research looking at gastroenterology, which is specifically focused on improving vagus nerve function and it shows positive outcomes and you're probably familiar with a lot of that stuff it vagal nerve stimulation for instance vagus nerve sim stimulation can radically improve inflammatory bowel disease it can radically improve ibs and SIBO. there's a lot of people who, who know this there's a lot of research that's been done on it so that is is very interesting this is a, this is a factual piece of information that the vagus nerve is central to maintaining digestive function so i'll give you an example you have a patient come into you and they say that they get chronic bloating, they're constipated, they've got low stomach acid, what's the first thing that you're going to be looking at? Usually what we're taught in functional medicine or nutrition, alternative nutrition, whatever you want to call it, we're taught, okay, do a gut test, you know, do a stool sample, look for an infection, look for this, look for that, look for that. Prescribe uh, betaine hydro hydrochloric acid, um, give digestive enzymes. Uh, if they come up on, on their test, they might have low pancreatic function, uh, or low pancreatic elastase, so you'd prescribe digestive enzymes. You also see that they've got high zonulin, so you see they've got intestinal permeability. So the first thing you think to do, okay, right, okay, I'm going to try L -B L um, sodium butyrate, I'm going to try L-glutamine, I'm going to do all of the, you know, by the book, alternative things that you do to fix leaky gut. And, and, and again, that is a useful con concept to for symptom management. But what we're not taught to look for is, okay, maybe, just maybe, it's not a coincidence that someone's stomach is not releasing enough stomach acid. It's not a coincidence that that is co-occurring with their intestine also not propelling food at the right rate, or their pancreas also not releasing uh, enough uh, digestive enzymes. I mean, like, again, 
it, there's a lot of coincidence theory, let's say. It's usually if you see a patient like this, most of the functions of their digestive system have like basically shut down. You know, they, they require laxatives. And it's like, we don't ask the question. We automatically assume that it's because of the microbiome, that it's because of the gut bugs. Whereas we're not necessarily, I think, trained to look at, okay, is is what we're looking at a, a let's say, a collection of symptoms which highlights, okay, the main central issue here is that none of the digestive organs are getting the right inputs from the nervous system. This is a higher level problem that we should be, you know, considering, I think. And again, I don't want to kind of project too much because that was just the way that I was trained to look at it. So I know that there's many practitioners who are branching out and there's a lot of interesting research looking at this stuff. But for the most part, I was very disenchanted or let's say uh, I wasn't happy with the results that I was getting with patients where oftentimes they would go um, through multiple different practitioners. They would be put on, maybe they'd be, be put on antibiotics from the doctor. Then they might be put on like six months of herbs. Then they might be put on like a, a gastrointestinal restoration program or something like that. And oftentimes these people are like nomads. They go from one practitioner to another practitioner because actually no one can help them. And they come to me and they're like, well, look, I tried this for the gut. I'd done this. I'd done that. And they that. Blah, 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 blah. And, and so I say to them, I'm like, okay, well, maybe the problem is not in your gut. And they're kind of like flabbergasted by that. But ultimately, this person is presenting with a collection of symptoms, which I think at least, and Lonsdale would have put it, and I, I, I've seen this play out in real life. What we're looking at is a form of autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Okay. Is that we're looking at a faulty communication from the brain to the gut. And nothing that you do in the gut is necessarily going to fix that because it's not getting to the root of the problem. And like you said before the call, no one is going to have a positive, like a, a healthy microbiome if the gut is is perpetually, like if the, if the actual intestinal tissue itself is perpetually um, dysfunctional for whatever reason. So there is that. So, so uh, just going back to what we said, and again, I don't want to go on for too long here, but Ultimately, I began seeing by chance that people would respond pretty miraculously within like sometimes within 24 hours to this treatment of thiamine, which I never anticipated. Um, so what I did was I started digging into the literature and it turns out that it was one of the first ever studies looking at induced thiamine deficiency in man. I don't think it would be ethical to do right now, um, but this was published in the 1940s. And what they did was they took six, pa six patients, they put them intentionally they put them on a diet which was like one tenth of the amount of thiamine that you need so it was like 10 micrograms or something per day and they follow them up they, they kept them in a controlled condition it was in it, within like a hospital hospital setting for um they put put them in there for, for three months and what they found was that they what they were looking for at that time they'd heard from the far east from in japan oh there's berry berry there's these there's all of these symptoms that are going to occur. So, so, so they're lo looking for that and seeing how long it took for these people to develop those symptoms. They were, <laughs> they were flabbergasted uh, by the end of the study. No one developed those symptoms. No one developed beriberi. No one developed vernic encephalopathy, which they were anticipating. So they actually made the wrong conclusion. They said, oh, well, B1 can't, can't cause this problem because these, these patients didn't get it. No, what they got instead, and this is where it gets very interesting, is they developed a collection of symptoms very early on that you would um, never associate with B1 deficiency. So really run-of-the-mill stuff that most of the people come to you to address. So for instance, insomnia, um, fatigue, muscle pain, body weakness, um, burning of the muscles, you know, sometimes tingling, neuropathy, but that came much later on. But one of the most consistent findings that they found in almost everyone was that stomach output increased. No, sorry. So stomach acidity decreased. Okay. That was one of the first things. They all developed constipation. They all developed bloating and gas. Basically, I saw this. I was reading this and I was like, SIBO, uh, you know, hypochloridria. What? You know, this was known back in the 1940s that one of the first signs of a marginal deficiency or a mild insufficiency wasn't berry berry. It wasn't this end stage nutritional disease that everyone is looking for. No, it was run in the mill, common digestive symptoms, bloating, hypochloridria, uh, acid reflux, etc. And so 
that 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 was that was fascinating because that was one of the first things that they they found and this was almost consistent in every single patient who only had a mild deficiency it got worse as time went on and they eventually started vomiting and thing and things in the third month but what this demonstrated to me was that okay people can have a very or let's say they can have a lack of this nutrient they're not going to develop problems that are severe enough to make them go to the er and at the same time, they can, some of the most consistent findings are these people develop really run of the mill digestive symptoms, which most people are taught to treat using probiotics and things like that. Whereas actually, what if we're looking at a situation where we have patients who sustain themselves on a diet, which is based on high calorie malnutrition, we have people consuming junk food for you know long periods of time and they develop adaptations they develop adaptations to very low levels of deficiency but what if we're looking what what if what if a lot of these you know so called functional digestive conditions are actually a mild manifestation of an underlying thiamine deficiency so i delved into it more i started that's like when i said i started translating a lot of the research in Japanese and Chinese. And it turns out that from the 1960s, they were treating constipation. They were treating acid reflux. They were treating a lot of these functional digestive issues with thiamine and with thiamine alone. Now, some, some of the research in uh, in China would use a combination of thiamine with a, uh, in, within an acupoint injection. So they'd actually inject thiamine to the acupoint. And this would be sometimes more beneficial than giving it orally. But in Japan, what they did was they started synthesizing lots of different types of B1. Um, and what they found was that different forms could actually increase the levels of B1 in the body uh, to a much greater extent than ordinary thiamine salts. And this is where you get the forms like benfotiamine or TTFD. They were all developed or synthesized in the 1950s and 60s in Japan. Okay. And so they started uh, studying this. And what they found was that um, these forms of B1, they could they could basically uh, use atrazine, which is a, a, a one of the methods in which they would study constant constipation, artificially induced constipation in animals. And then they would give different forms of thiamine and they would find that certain types could completely remove the block that atrazine had on constipation. And it worked by enhancing the release of acetylcholine at the neuron level. And this is something I haven't spoken about, but because thiamine is so central to the production is necessary for the production and the release of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, uh, this is probably how it is working for digestive conditions. So let me just give you a very brief overview is that what I believe and what I think the research substantiates is that sometimes IBS, SIBO, chronic um, reflux, basically any function of hypo function of the digestive system. So if there's a lack of secretion or if there's a lack of motility, and I think most digestive issues fall under that category. Most of the people that you would see if you're not a gastroenterologist, let's say, but so if, if, there's a, if there's a lack of secretion or a lack of motility, it is usually because there is a block or there, there is a reduction in nerve firing from the uh, vagus nerve or from the enteric nervous system to the, to the cells itself. Okay. Now, if we look at what the enteric nervous system uses along with the vagus nerve, what do they use? What neurotransmitter do they use? They use acetylcholine. Okay. Acetylcholine. So Acetylcholine is known in the brain for Im improving memory or cognition, and what, that's one of the reasons why um, cholinergic drugs are being used quite successfully in Alzheimer's dementia. But if you look at what it does in the rest of the nervous system, well, it's the main neurotransmitter used by the parasympathetic or by the vagus nerve, okay? And the vagus nerve is the thing which is telling the digestive organs what to do. So in someone who, for whatever reason, does not have enough B1 or someone who, for whatever reason, does not have uh, enough of the cholinergic neurons, cholinergic signals being passed through that, 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 that information highway, then B1 is potentially working by enhancing acetylcholine at the level of the digestive organ itself and at the level of the vagus nerve. And it turns out that some of the early findings on vitamin B1, even if you go into the into the um, the Japanese literature, there's a, a gem of a book which was published in 1960. It was uh, translated into English, but it was all of the Japanese literature that had been done up until that point. And what they found was that in many cases, uh, B1 deficiency not only could it cause one of the main presenting symptoms, not only was it low stomach acid, but it could also be high stomach acid. And that was very interesting. And they surmised that it was basically um, uh, 
not necessarily just a lack of information or a lack of nervous system signaling from the brain to the gut, but also faulty signaling. So for instance, you may have excessive signals going in one direction and faulty or inhibited signals going in another direction. And this is where it gets to using this clinically. It's where it gets very interesting. But basically what I've learned is, is that um, some people can present in opposite ways and both suffer the same problem, the root cause, which is um, basically a lack of nervous system signaling, but it can go either as uh, excessive function. So for instance, excessive motility or impaired motility, excessive um, stomach acid output or low stomach acid output. And so it's very interesting and it seems to come back to nervous system regulation. Um, but even the early research on animals and in humans, they found that one of the first things that tends to go when someone is mildly deficient in B1, not only the digestive function itself, but the vagus nerve. So, and this is where it comes back to this broader umbrella of dysautonomia, which is what Lonsdale specialized in, is that if you lose um, proper control of the vagus nerve, which is what happens and one is, is one of the first consequences of a lack of B1. If you lose function of the vagus nerve, then not only can you not control your digestive system, um, but many times you also can't control anything else. So this is where your people who have POTS, who have um, issues with circulation, their blood vessels don't dilate and open properly, they can't regulate their body temperature, they might get dizzy, they might get orthostatic hypertension, um, they might have uh, excessive fatigue, or they might feel excessively jittery. So their sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive or their parasympathetic nervous system is in overdrive because they're not able to shift effectively between one and the other. And ultimately, if you look at the, the, the underlying, uh, the driver, many times it is a lack of B1. And I think it stems back to this concept of high calorie malnutrition. Many of your clients or many of my clients, at least I've gone through decades of consuming junk food um, and they decide to start on a healthy diet, but that's not necessarily going to resolve, you know, 15, 20 years of abuse to their body. Um, and there are also many other things. If they have some kind of an underlying disease process itself, that may be inhibiting or blocking the utilization of B1. And so we end up with the same principle that their vagus nerve stops working and that they can no longer um, make the right digestive uh, uh their, their digestive system stops working. And so the symptoms that you might see, and and, and if you look even for something as, as benign as, as acid reflux, that can, in many cases, be one of the first signs of an underlying B1-induced or B1-deficiency-induced dysautonomia, simply because every single sphincter is being told what to do. It's being told when to open, when to close. Like I said, there is this coordinated set of events, which is miraculous when you when you read about it and you wonder like, how the hell does this happen in real time? This is like instantaneous stuff. It's crazy. You know, the waves of contraction, the, the way that the stomach moves is all in, in, in like a, it's like an orchestra of different events. And it's just beautiful and miraculous and amazing that it can even, even happen. Uh, but ultimately, it only happens if there's the right signals coming from the nervous system. And if you lose that, then the sphincter just simply can't close. It's like, yeah, okay, well, we'll open it this time, and then we'll close it this time. Or, yeah, okay, well, um, we don't know that stomach, the, 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 the food in the stomach is meant to go into the small intestine. So it's just going to sit here. That's one of the reasons why you have people who have food, which literally just sits in the stomach and they have to do like maneuvers and stuff to get it into the small intestine. It's like, well, rather than just giving hydrochloric acid, which can come in handy, why not, you know, in these people, it may actually be that they're just not getting the right signals. So maybe if we try and enhance the signals, this can help. I hope I haven't gone too long there.